Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this afternoon. Hope your day has been going well. I'm Dr. Shaniqua Vogues. I'm one of the geriatricians in the Department of Medicine at UW, and today we'll just be providing some coronavirus updates. And so I'll start off by providing just a little refresher on the novel coronavirus, um, then transition into discuss the COVID-19 vaccine, ending with some frequently asked questions regarding the vaccine. And so coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 is caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 because it's in the family of coronaviruses. It has a sequence that's similar to bats. And the first outbreak of coronavirus was found in Wuhan, China, in December of 2019. And so transmission is via person-to-person -person contact, uh, via close contact respiratory droplets or airborne transmission with some few cases of person-to-animal transmission. Some preventative measures are using at least a 60% alcohol-based hand sanitizer or washing our hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Avoid touching eyes, nose, or your mouth uh, when your hands are unclean and try to stay away from individuals who are ill, as well as maintaining social distance when out in the public, especially around individuals from a different household and making sure we're wearing our face masks and covering our nose and mouth. Uh, it's important to clean surfaces often with soap and water or an EPA or Environmental Protection Agency registered household disinfectant. And so that was just a brief overview of coronavirus. And now we're going to transition to discuss some updates regarding COVID vaccines. And so first I'll start off by covering some unfamiliar terms to some. Um, first one being messenger RNA or messenger ribonucleic acid, which carries genetic information or the code. Uh, vector is a vehicle that's used for transportation. In regards to vaccines, it's the vehicle that's carrying the genetic information or the code needed to make a protein. And in protein, that's where our genes are made, our protein, protein is made from genes. And so basically we start with DNA, which contains our genetic information. And the DNA is typically housed in the nucleus of a cell. Uh, DNA transcribes this genetic information on a code to messenger RNA, which will translate the information on a code to make a protein. This image is basically depicting what I was describing where you have initially the replication of DNA and then you have your code or your genetic information which is housed within DNA. DNA is gonna transcribe this information to RNA or messenger RNA, which will then translate it on a code into a protein. And so there are currently three types of coronavirus uh, vaccines in development. Uh, the first type being a messenger RNA, which is combined with nanolipid particles. You have an adenovirus vector where you have the adenovirus serving as the vehicle carrying the protein. And then also a recombinant protein subunit. And in the case of these coronavirus vaccines, the protein of interest in this case is the spike protein. And the spike protein are basically the envelope of the coronavirus, also what gives the virus the name corona because the spike proteins look like a crown on electron microscopy. And so this is our target with vaccination because the spike proteins are needed for coronavirus to attach itself to our host cells and cause an infection. And so these new vaccines are targeting this spike protein. So our body is able to recognize the spike protein and produce antibody by eliciting an immune response. 
And so this is just a larger image to show the three different types of corona vaccines in development. You have your recombinant protein, uh, the adenovirus, where you have the adenovirus serving as that vehicle, and then the messenger RNA, which takes a specific portion of the genetic information containing the code needed to make the spike protein, which our body will identify and elicit an immune response to produce antibody. And so the messenger RNA vaccine provides the genetic instructions for our cells to build the spike protein, which is the outer envelope of the coronavirus. Once those instructions are within the cell, the protein pieces are made. And once the protein piece is made, the genetic instructions are broken down and discarded. And so the messenger RNA is disintegrated. And so this image is just showing a depiction of someone getting a vaccine uh, with the messenger RNA vaccine and say you have your genetic information, which is the information needed to make the spike protein. Our messenger RNA enters the cell and then keep in mind for when we discuss this later on, you have your nucleus here and in the nucleus is where our DNA is kept and keeps that genetic information. The messenger RNA that's entering the cell never enters the nucleus. Its business happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. So the messenger RNA is translating that genetic information to form the spike protein, which is our protein of interest in this case. So then spike proteins are presented on the outside of a whole cell so it can be recognized by our immune system. So you generate various immune responses. In this case, you see a B cell, uh, which produces antibodies, but also activates the T helper cell to generate memory. So we're able to respond to those spike proteins even quicker in the future. And then this is another image uh, just showing the various immune responses to attack the spike protein, where here you have your coronavirus being attacked by antibodies, which are produced by our B cells, uh, your T helper cells, which are helping to generate memory, but you also have your antigen presenting cells, which pick up the pr spike protein uh, and allows it to present this to our T helper cells, but then also your antigen presenting cells are activating our killer T cells, which are gonna also destroy the coronavirus. So several mechanisms to rid the body of this foreign antigen. And so currently the messenger RNA vaccines are the only vaccines that have been approved for emergency authorization use. And out of those, uh, we have Pfizer and Moderna. And so the Pfizer vaccine, once again, is messenger RNA vaccine that targets the spike protein made, and it's made with a nanolipid particle. And with Pfizer, as well as Moderna, it's a two-dose series. With Pfizer, it's three weeks apart. And in this particular clinical trial, individuals were 16 years of age and older. With Moderna, it's still a two-dose series. However, it's four weeks apart, and the individuals with Moderna's trials were 18 years of age and older. Some common side effects from vaccination are injection site pain, fatigue, muscle pain, and aches, joint pain, as well as headache. Some common questions asked regarding the COVID vaccine. Uh, can you get COVID from the vaccine? No, because with the messenger RNA vaccine, it's not the live coronavirus. It's really just taking a specific genetic information or the information needed to make the spike protein. We're not using uh, the live virus. So you won't get coronavirus from the vaccine. Can the messenger RNA and vaccine alter your DNA? Uh, no, messenger RNA vaccine is not, does not have the ability to alter your DNA. The um, 
translating a protein that's occurring with the genetic information provided from DNA that occurs in the cytoplasm. And that's taken from the coronavirus through their messenger RNA vaccine platform. And so we're using the messenger RNA um, information that's needed to create the spike protein, but that reaction occurs in the cytoplasm and does not enter the nucleus. And then also our body does not have the ability to make DNA from RNA because it's an enzyme that's evolved that involved for this particular reaction that we don't possess. So the messenger RNA will not alter your DNA. And then no steps were skipped when creating the messenger RNA vaccines. Both Pfizer and Moderna went through a phase three clinical trial and this table is showing, so with Pfizer, they had over 43,000 participants in their phase three study, and Moderna had over 30,000. Pfizer had a 95% efficacy, and Moderna had a 94%. And so this was the, the phase three clinical trial to, taste, to test the safety and efficacy of these vaccines. Other questions, uh, there aren't any chips in the vaccine that would be used to hurt or track anyone. Uh, one, because the messenger RNA um, is made up in a nanolipid solution, a saline solution, which may, uh, if it was a chip, it would probably be destroyed from the solution that the messenger RNA is being preserved in. But then also, uh, these vaccines are being provided, being provided through a very small needle, 22 gauge needle, so very small opening, which would be too small to put a chip in. The vaccine is safe, I mean, sorry, free for anyone with or, with or without insurance. They have private insurance as well as public community programs to cover the cost of the vaccine, so everyone who is willing to have the vaccine, is able to have it done. Should I be vaccinated if I had an allergic reaction to bees, medications, or foods in the past? It's recommended that everyone get uh, vaccinated, but also if you have a severe allergic reaction, I would definitely be mindful of that and have a discussion with your primary care provider. And if you were to go forward and have the vaccine, make sure the person administering the vaccine is aware of it, but also to show that they have safety mechanisms in place to monitor you um, for any potential adverse reaction or severe allergic reaction. And so when you receive your first or second dose of your corona vaccine, your COVID vaccine, you have to sit there for 15 minutes to make sure you don't have a severe allergic reaction. And so this table is, is information from the first dose of the Pfizer COVID vaccine, uh, which was given December 14th through the 23rd. And it was approximately almost 1.9 million who received their first dose of Pfizer. And out of that 1.9, um, approximately 1.9 individuals, they had a little over 4,000 adverse events. 0.2%. And so this equated to approximately 11 adverse events per 1 million people receiving their first dose of the Pfizer coronavirus vaccine. And so the average amount of time of symptom onset for individuals who had a true anaphylactic reaction out of 21 um, individuals, the average amount of time was 12 minutes. And then also 81% of individuals who had a true anaphylactic reaction had a documented history of an allergy or allergic reaction. Most individuals in this study had allergic reactions to medications. You had a few who um, noted bee allergy um, also. And so with the Moderna first dose, this one was from December 21st to January 10th, and they vaccinated 4 million individuals and had 0.03% adverse events. And so this equated to 
2.5 reactions per million individuals receiving their first dose of the Moderna COVID vaccine. And so in this particular study, uh, of the 10 true anaphylactic reactions that they did have, the average time for symptom onset was seven and a half minutes. So you had 12 minutes with the Pfizer vaccine and seven and a half minutes with Moderna. And so what they do is 15 minutes you have to sit after receiving uh, your first or second dose of your COVID vaccine to pick up individuals who may potentially have a severe allergic reaction to the vaccine. So moving on to more questions. Um, yes, because coronavirus is a new disease, there's little known about the long-term uh, consequences of coronavirus, but also the vaccine, the messenger RNA uh, vaccine, this is new as well. And so we don't know much about the long-term risk of the vaccine. And so this is why we take, they're taking a lot of safety measures to monitor people, but a lot of studies have been done also. And then with vaccines, typically if someone is going to have a reaction to the va vaccine, it's within the six weeks of receiving your vaccination. Are there long-term studies on messenger RNA vaccines? Yes, messenger R the messenger RNA vaccine platform has been studied for over three decades. And it started, and messenger RNA vaccines have been used um, to develop vaccines for the Zika virus, Ebola virus. They actually attempted to develop a messenger RNA for influenza, but also messenger RNA vaccines have been used as a form of cancer therapy as well um, with um, melanomas and non-small cell lung cancer. If you've had COVID, should you still get your vaccine? Yes, you should definitely still get your vaccine despite having a previous uh, past, a past COVID infection. Uh, one is because coronavirus is a virus and viruses have the tendency to mutate as a defense mechanism to trick our body so they're not as easily identified. When you receive your messenger RNA vaccine, this is a specific portion of the genetic information used to make the spike protein, which is the target. And so this is not being uh, mutated. And then also the vaccine produces a uh, much higher immune response than what's produced with a past infection and also with the convalescent serum. So it will still be important to be vaccinated. And so this is a study by Rain Verbecki and others is a review of the progression in the messenger RNA vaccine development showing that they've been studying this approach since 1961 where they were still identifying the type of immune cells responsible <clears throat> Um, and generating an immune response from a messenger RNA vaccine, starting with the dendritic cells, which served as antigen presenting cells also. And so throughout looking at the different immune responses, modifying how to store the messenger RNA, um, showing that messenger RNA were used as cancer vaccines here with the melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer. And this goes up to 2019, just to show that the messenger RNA vaccine platform wasn't a development that just started in 2019 or 2020. It's been going on or it's been occurring since 1961. And so as of today, there have been more than 26 million cases of coronavirus in the US and over 439,000 deaths. In Wisconsin, we've had more than 537,000 cases of coronavirus with over 5,800 deaths. There have been 47 million doses of the coronavirus vaccine distributed in the US with more than 24 million individuals receiving their first dose of the COVID vaccine. Here in Wisconsin, we've had more than 335,000 individuals receiving their COVID vaccine. Just some highlights for us all. 
And so when thinking about being vaccinated with the new coronavirus vaccine, I think it's a personal decision, but also keeping in mind that the messenger RNA vaccines have been studied for three decades. And then understanding that coronavirus is a new disease to all of us with uncertain an uncertain clinical course and long-term health consequences that we're still learning about. It's showing that people are having, it's a study showing that people are still having um, some long-term effects even six months out um, following coronavirus. And usually with the post-viral syndrome, individuals may still have a lagging cough or fatigue. However, coronavirus is uh, causing more extensive damage to different organ parts. And so fatigue is still the most common post-viral syndrome that they're identifying following a coronavirus infection. But what's more concerning is that individuals who had an asymptomatic presentation, as well as those who have more severe presentations of coronavirus are having these long-term effects, which are impacting your lungs with still a low, lower lung function, uh, more than three months out, but also affecting the heart, causing inflammation of the heart on the thin layer as well as on the muscle, which can cause irregular heart rhythms. And some people have noted uh, some kidney uh, dysfunction as well as a long-term consequence, but also keeping in mind with our more vulnerable population, brain fog has been a symptom that a lot of people are discussing as well in addition to having a chronic fatigue, which just contributes to deconditioning if the individual is just not able to build up their stamina. So really when thinking about getting vaccinated, we have to weigh our risks and cons. I'll look at the risks and the benefits of this vaccine, as well as factoring in the long-term consequences of getting coronavirus, which we are still trying to understand. And so I received my vac vaccines, I received both doses. And some of the reasons um, why I chose to get vaccinated is one, I myself was real sick in March. However, that was during a time when it wasn't much testing going on. So I really don't know what I was infected with, but it was just assumed that it was the flu. However, I was down for at least a week and continued to be uh, tired and uh, really didn't have my stamina, wasn't able to exercise for a month. And it just was a very gradual process, just building my strength. Um, personal experiences, seeing the complications of COVID in a small child, uh, which really touched me to have to go through uh, so much. But then also caring for a vulnerable population, uh, wanted to keep patients safe, thinking about my family, and also thinking about the community. Those are all the things I factored in when considering uh, my vaccination. And so transitioning uh, with the community, I would just like to put in a plug for our Building Bridges project, which is a community engagement activity or well, community engagement project with the ultimate goal of increasing dementia awareness uh, by looking at alternative recruitment strategies. And so the purpose of this project is to examine the impact of community engagement activities uh, by looking at trust in medical researchers, as well as an individual's willingness to participate in research based on two community activities. One activity is dementia, different dementia series via uh, virtual presentations uh, with various topics on related around dementia, but then also by doing a one-on-one -on -one medication review session where we sit down with the participant look at their home medications and identify any medications that may be potentially affecting that individual's memory so they can have that discussion with their primary care provider.
And so I'll provide my contact information here if anyone would possibly be interested in participating in any part of the Building Bridges project. We will also be doing focus group discussions as well to get your input on some of the PowerPoint um, topics, as well as some barriers to participating in research studies. You can call or send a text to the following number, email me, but also follow us on Facebook.